Good evening and thank you for joining us. My name is Chrissy and I would like to welcome you to the Doylestown Bookshop's virtual event series. I am very excited to introduce best-selling author Maureen Johnson as she discusses her newest book, Hello Cruel Heart, an electric new story of teenage Cruella DeVille with the creator and host of the number one charted podcast, Noble Blood, Danish Schwartz. The authors will be in conversation for about 30 to 40 minutes and will be participating in a Q&A with the viewers. If you would like to submit a question, please click on ask a question at the bottom of your screen and enter your question there. If you're watching from a phone or tablet, click the icon with a question mark to submit your questions. If you would like to purchase their books from the Doylestown Bookshop, click the button on your screen that says buy the books. We have curbside pickup available at both of our locations or we can ship the book to you. Maureen was nice enough to send us some signed book plates, which will be given to each customer who orders their copy of Hello Cruel Heart from the Doylestown or Lahaska Bookshop. I've had a few questions uh, during past events from viewers who are accustomed to Zoom events, so to avoid any confusion there, only our guests and I will be able to participate through audio and video. You may, however, interact with us through the chat box on your screen and through the Q&A. Now, a little bit about our guests. Maureen Johnson is the New York Times and USA Today best-selling author of several YA novels, including 13 Little Blue Envelopes, The Name of the Star, and Truly Devious. She also has done collaborative works such as Let It Snow with John Green and Laura Miracle, recently released as a full Netflix film. She has an MFA in writing from Columbia University and lives in New York City. Dana Schwartz is the author of three books, including the memoir, Choose Your Own Disaster, and the humor book, The White Man's Guide to White Male Writers of the Western Canon, based on her viral parody Twitter account, at Guy in Your MFA. Her fourth book, Anatomy, is forthcoming from Wednesday Books. Hello, Maureen and Dana. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I started laughing because in the background of Dana's, like if you just look over Dana's shoulder, suddenly this cat was like, oh no. <laughs> trying to get out a window. It was really yeah. funny. I did warn, warn people that my cat, it, we're edging towards my cat's dinner time. So he might get a little more aggressive as the Zoom goes on. Now Zoom, Crowdcast. That's <laughs> okay. It looked well, like a, you... it was a little escape movie that was going on, or it was like he was doing, he was in the glass box, but it was very exciting. Oh, yeah. he's, he's an incredibly talented mime. Yeah, most oh, cats are. Goodness. Well, I'm looking forward to your conversation. I'm going to hop off screen and let you get to it. Woo! Maureen, I we got um, squished so, together. Yeah, I, love, uh, I am so excited that you asked me to do this event and that I got to read your amazing book. You're just such a ridiculously fun and smart writer. Uh, so thank you for this book. And jumping into questions, how would you sum it up in like, you know, the core news clip elevator pitch summary of this book for people who might not be familiar? Yeah, I always worry when people say elevator pitch, because I'm like, I know. You, you, you get on an elevator with me. I'm like, I hope you're in this elevator for a while. Because I have a long and roundabout way of describing what it begins with. Also, the fact that I said the elevator pitch is just like I've been in Los Angeles for way too long. No, I, I mean, I, I know that that's, a, I've tried. I try to get it down to a little nugget, but my meandering style just, it just keeps happening. But it's, we're going to follow the story of Cruella de Vil before she was Cruella de Vil and back when she was just Estella for that was her name. And it's the summer of 1967. She lives in London with her friends, Jar uh, ha Horace and Jasper. I have been combining their names. I've been saying their names so many times this week that it's become like Horace to Jasper. Jasper. That's their, that's their celebrity couple name. Jo Jorish. Jasper. Jorah. Hasper. It's just become a mush. But she lives in a, they live in a burned out, bombed out, part of a building that's been left over from the war. And they have an amazing lair that they live in. It's all very fantastical, but it's also half of a bombed out building. And they survive on thieving, on pickpocketing, and just getting enough to survive. And Estella is a fashion designer. She knows it in her heart. She knows she's brilliant. 
but how do you bust into the world of fashion when you are a poor orphan who lives in a bombed out building and steals money and clothes and milk to survive and live? And as it happens, because it is the summer of 1967 in London, the most exciting, one of the most exciting places to live in all of history, like, that's why I was excited about this book, because of my lifelong natural obsession with what was going on in London around 1967. You have the Beatles coming out with Sgt. Pepper. You have color. You have just the stuff that was going on is so high fidelity and so much everywhere. And she springs into the scene uh, because she meets a rich brother and sister who kind of take her up as a hobby and break her into London society. And of course, it's a, a tie into the upcoming Disney movie, Cruella. And we were talking a little earlier, that movie uh, you know, takes place in the 70s, sort of mm -hmm. like the punk rock more era. We're about 10 years earlier. But in terms of consistency, what access did you have to those materials and stories so you knew where you were getting to? Right. I got lots of cool stuff. Uh, I got to read the script. Uh, and because this was written during lockdown, there's it was hard to see things. However, they made all of these amazing walkthroughs of the set, walkthroughs of the art design, walkthrough of the wardrobe. Um, and so I got to see, I, it was like I was walking around the set of Cruella. And one of the one of the things that I mean, you're an LA person, so you must be much more familiar with this. But just the level of detail, just the yeah. absolutely breathtaking, mind-boggling level of detail uh, with the the construction of the sets, right down to the patterns of the marble. Like they built like ballrooms and and the just level of detail and all of the clothes and. They recreate Lo Liberty of London in the 1970s and they yeah. remade all of these purses and fashions and it's mind blowing. So that's, I got to, I got access to all of those things. That's amazing. But then for this time period, for like the swing 60s, like mm -hmm. swinging London, how did you research? How did you get into that mindset and how did you figure out what London would be like then? Uh, I almost didn't have to do anything because since I was about 13 years old, I have had a, I think we all have our own obsessions and fixations with things. And this was for me, uh, that thing. And re the reason I wanted to do this was because something had come along where I was like, finally, I can make something about the thing that I know the most about this it's this subject and like a handful of others, like mystery novels and a couple of other things. But I got obsessed with the music when I was around 13 years old. I heard Sgt. Pepper and I said, this is my life now. And I started reading and burrowing down and listening to anything and everything I could get my hands on. So I think I may have frightened my editor when I came back with like, and then she'll go here and she'll go there and she'll go to Granny Takes a Trip because that was, you know, and that the season that that, that particular season, they were having this in the window. And then I'll put them on the street with Mick and Marianne and I'll move them a couple doors down on Shane Walk. Like the amount of actual correct detail in this book is unnecessary, but it is, it is there. <laughs> I was literally about yeah. to ask you, uh, which places are real and which are imaginary because I just wanted to live in all of them. They're almost entirely real. I think I only made up, I made up one club um, called the Silver Circus, but everything else is real. Uh, oh, that's not true. Yeah. I, the Caterpillar? The Caterpillar is not real, but it is based very, very closely on a, on a place called the Flying Dragon. Cool. And... Uh, which has a very interesting and weird backstory. But if you ever look up the flying dragon, London, 1967, you will actually see a big flying dragon painted on the front of a building. And they did kind of project the sky and the ground. And I changed it a little bit, but it's pretty accurate as to what it really looked like. But the boutiques, Granny Takes a Trip, um, that's that's a real and very famous heady place. Um, Estella stays on Shane Walk, which is a street in London with 
uh, the rich people that she meets, Richard and Magda. And on that street, that particular year, lived many of the Rolling Stones, including Mick Jagger and Marianne Faithful, and then Some Doors Down, Keith Richards and Anita Poundberg. So I just slotted them in and said, I'm going to make them your neighbors. So, oh my God, David Bowie, who, is, who lives here, was around the corner. I put the location of the party where his house would have been around the corner on Oakley. That's so cool. Oakley so that's a great transition. Uh, music is obviously mm -hmm. a big part of this story, and uh, young Estella meets a, uh, I will say, dashing guitarist of an up and coming band. What was music like in your creative process? Do you listen to music while you write? Uh, what type of music do you listen to while you write? And also, were there particular uh, bands or musicians that, that informed that particular character? Oh, yes. I don't listen to music. I don't know about you. I don't listen to music when I write. It's very rare. I, I listen to movie scores. Only wordless, oh, like classical music. Yes. Like, that's what I... It gets, I make a playlist of like movies that I feel like have the right vibe. So that's... Yeah. I've done that because if I listen to songs, I end up listening to songs. I have a brain that kind of does one thing. And so I'll just like start typing lyrics accidentally. Like my, my left and right brain will, will frick together. Every once in a while I can listen to music while I'm working. Uh, I did that recently. Uh, I just finished a book called the box in the woods which has a surprising amount of Fleetwood Mac in it. And I ended up playing rumors a lot, but um, I, I, with this one, definitely inspired by a lot of bands. Um, and I wasn't sure if people would be interested or, or not. Like it's so weedy, uh, hmm. all of the references. I was like, how many hours do you have? You know, I don't know that people necessarily want to know but i will tell you i want to know give all me, right give me a few recommendations because i all have right. terrible taste in music no i'm sure you do not no i really do i sometimes sunday morning my boyfriend and i will play like music for each other and he's like dana you always play taylor swift because i'm still just a 14 year old girl i don't know any cool music There's but like give me some cool music please so the romantic lead in this is named peter he is a multi-instrumentalist and I took the multi-instrumental part from Brian Jones, who was a member of the Rolling Stones, uh, who could play pretty much anything he picked up seemingly. Uh, he was like famous for just making music come out of almost any object that he touched. If he'd never played it before, it really didn't seem to matter. I hate um, those people. He, I mean, he has a lot of, I mean, to be fair, Brian Jones has a lot of issues and and died young, um, very tragically. But he, for example, if you've ever heard the song Ruby Tuesday by the Rolling Stones, that lilting recorder line, he's the one that puts these little strange lines through a lot of the Rolling Stone songs. Um, mm. He, yeah, he, he was a very innovative musically. And also the, the vocals and the stylings of a man named Steve Marriott, who was the lead singer of a band called The Small Faces, which released in 1967, an album called Ogden's Not Gone Flake, which is an incredible, incredible album. And people like the Beatles were very much in awe of Steve Marriott and his powers. He has an amazing voice. And if you ever wanna see a cool video of him singing, uh, Google a song called uh, Tin Soldier. And that's one I would recommend. I will. Yeah. Uh, so are there any other specific figures from pop culture that influenced how you portrayed Estella? Sort of as mm. this like cooler than cool, punk, gutter scum, icon, fashion muse model? Well, she, it strikes me as hilarious that I have written a book that involves fashion. It's just funny. Um, that is, How much do you know about fashion? I dress like a five-year-old auditioning to be a four-year-old. <laughs> but the only there's only a few periods of fashion I know anything about. And the only one I know about in detail is this window between like 1967 and uh, hello. I promised you a Beetlejuice cameo. He just jumped onto my lap. Is he a Maine Coon Cat? 
He is a street cat, but we think there is some Maine Coon in him because he's very fluffy. Look at that big fluffy tail, y'all. Look at it. Big fluffy tail. Big it, fluffy tail. It's so uh, I, fluffy. Does he all just want to say hi to the people? Oh, he's made of fur. He's a fuzzy boy. Okay, but back to the important thing mm. of this is the only period that you know anything about fashion? Pretty much. Um, <laughs> How? Just like genuine knowledge, genuine interest? I think so. Um, for example, uh, the designer Ozzy Clark. Very yeah. much. I mean, if you've never seen the Ozzy Clark clothes, they're just magical. He lived with Celia Burtwell, who was, I think they were married actually, Celia Burtwell and Ozzy Clark. And she designed, and she is still a textile and fabric designer. So she Amazing. would make these patterns and fabrics, and he designed these clothes that are just, they're like water running off the body. Everybody in a, in an Ozzy Clark dress looks like they are running through a field of flowers, no matter what they're doing. They are gauzy. They are sort of, apparently he was so brilliantly talented. He could just sort of cut blind and just, he just was one of those supremely gifted people that was, you know, they're amazing. amazing. Oh my God. But just the stuff that was being made around this time is, you know, this is London 20 years after World War II. So we think of London as kind of shiny and bright, and but it's also kind of gray and dark. And at this point, it was still pretty damaged from the war. And people had been, you know, food was rationed. They had ration books. They had, people were kind of slightly underfed. And, you know, it was, it had been a rough go. And then in the late, in the mid to late sixties, all of a sudden this kind of poof of activity, it's like flowers yeah. coming out of the cracks in the concrete. And That's it's a beautiful way to put it. It's very colorful. All of a sudden, everything is very, very, very impossible to overstate how colorful, but also they're making dresses out of paper. They're making dresses out of metal. They're making dresses out of plastic. They're, wearing feather boas, they're, they're wearing military garb, they're wearing antiques, they're just, it's, it becomes sort of costuming. It's incredible. Is Estella based or inspired by any specific like actual figures at the time? I mean, like Ozzy Clark's wife or? No, she's, she's just Estella, but she's very much rooted in those, um, she's looking around at everything that's happening at the time. So the, one of the big ones before her, before this period would have been Mary Quant who invented the mini skirt, basically. Oh, yeah. And then Ozzy Clark who's coming in later with these flowing garments. But then there are all these super cool, beyond cool, terrifying boutiques like Granny Takes a Trip um, that have things that are like velvet coats and, and things with faces painted down the back of them. And, so I took a lot of the styles from the things that she makes from places like Granny Takes a Trip or Mr. 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 There's another one called Mr. Fish. The the Beatles had their own boutique. That was, I didn't know that. They had it was short lived because they did not know how to run a boutique, but they employed a Dutch design team called the Fool, and I posted some pictures of the Fool up on Instagram, and they are psychedelic they look like psychedelic renaissance fair people they are wearing what appears to be wizard's capes they run around playing the flute they design rainbow clothes they painted the side of the beatles building with a gigantic psychedelic mural but nobody got permission so basically everyone in london woke up and there was a giant psychedelic mural and they were like you are not allowed to do that oh to be the beatles and yeah. to have that, that confidence yeah, they were. It was called Apple Boutique. It only lasted, I think, about nine months, and then oh. they decided to um, shut it down. And they let everybody just kind of storm the place and take all the clothes they wanted. And that's how it ended. Oh. I mean, that go out with a bang. That sounds fun. They sounds really like did. Party. They really did. This is now my most like nitty gritty, like in the weeds writer brain question because I'm always so curious when I talk to other writers, like how organized are you in your actual writing process in terms of outlining in terms of sticking to a schedule or are you just like open a blank page see where it takes me or do you have a system 
Uh, it depends on the book. Um, so say, because recently I've been writing a lot of mysteries. Yeah. And they're completely plotted because mysteries are a whole different ball of wax where you have, to, for me, I know everything that's going to happen because everything is based around, I know the solution, I know who did it and why and who was where before anything really gets started. So that's one, that makes one sense. what's one type. Um, with this, I did write the book in miniature kind of, I wrote out huh. the story. That's sort of what I do, I think, is I write the books in miniature and sort of tell the story in 15 or 20 pages sometimes and sort of say, okay, huh. this is, I think this one I probably told in about five to eight pages. I was like, this is how I see it going down. Um, so I've gotten more structured as time has gone on. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and did you say you wrote this book in, pan this was just a full pandemic book? Yeah entirely 100% during the worst of the New York pandemic was that's when a lot of it was written when we were entirely, entirely locked in and couldn't go. Yeah, it was really bad here and we couldn't, we couldn't do anything at all. I mean, we could barely go out in the hallway. So um, it was like, I guess it was like, okay, I guess I'm just going to time travel to London in 1967 every day. And I've fully yeah. indulged anything I want to see or watch or do. <laughs> it's like pure escapism. I mean, you feel that reading the book. You're like, you describe these places in such loving detail that it feels like you're there. I guess that is a function. Maybe that is the function of the pandemic. Did you do a lot of writing during the pandemic? I also, I mean, I, I finished a book that's coming out next January, that was a pandemic book. Which I will tell you, was, I have read. It's really good. What you read? Oh, and it will, you. and it will take you back to Edinburgh in 1830? 1817. eighteen thirty, eighteen seventeen. Yeah, right, yeah. right there. Yeah. I mean, it, it's 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 a mushy time, but yeah, it's again. I think I I wanted just to get away from yeah. America right now. Yeah, yeah. There was there was nothing. Yeah, it was, I, I had to spend most of my time because uh, my husband was entirely and is still entirely working from home and our dog was barking. And so we'd all kind of hunker together in the living room. And so yeah. all of it was written in a, in a chair in the living room with me going, not playtime, it's nap time. <laughs> Let's go to London. So a thing about Cruella in this book, Estella, Cruella is the alter ego that is given to her for like when she gets angry, her like Hulk side, her, her doc, her Mr. Hyde, her uh, Sasha Fierce, if you will. Mm. Um, one, where did that idea come from? And then do you ever have your own Sasha Fierce slash Cruella? Um, it will. Sasha Fierce is like the positive side of it. Right. Cruella is like the negative side. So, I read the script and there are scenes in this in the movie you'll see where Corella is kind of her it's the mean girl inside of Estella. Yeah. And the more I thought about it it seemed like Estella it's the self-critical part of her. It's the part that says no one really likes you. Why would you even bother? Like why do you think that you would be able to do this? Why you think you're going to get into fashion? You're not getting into fashion. None of these people care about you. And it's that self-critical, it's that self-critical but critical of others voice that the self-protective voice that tries to yeah. keep everyone else away. But with uh, her, it it tends to take over. Yeah. So again, have you ever uh like had that where you either a positive negative, but like something that you externalize to a different part of you? I don't know about that. I honestly don't know. And I think it's that I lack self-awareness. Um, that can't be true. You are one of the most like intuitive and like smart writers uh, in terms of like close third, like perspective. You have to be an incredibly intuitive person and an incredibly self-aware person. No, it's like, if it's the, I love John Mulaney. And he has the line about, I don't know what my body's for except to move my head from room to room. And I was like, yeah, that's how I feel. 
Like, I, I don't know. I'm like, I don't know. Like, um, but I do feel pretty. One thing I felt pretty strongly about is that Estella, she's in the lair. She can't, they can't really, they don't get to go out and do much. They don't have any money. Um, so she makes her clothes and she wants to be something, but she doesn't know how to do it because how do you become a fashion designer? Like, and when I was a kid, I just wrote all the time and I wanted to be a writer, but I was like, how do you become a writer? I don't know. Like, that, I don't know how that happens. It's just, I'm going to write here in my room. And then I guess somehow I'm going to try to get this out there somehow, but I have zero idea how that happens. None. Yeah. And I think that's probably what I was trying to convey is the, you want to be something, but you don't know how to be it. Yeah. That sort of feeling, especially when you're surrounded by, in Estella's case, somewhere that's so active and alive. You're like, how do I become a part of this? Yeah. Or if you're at school and you're like, how can I be with them? Like those yeah. people. I, I, I'm so close. And yet I might as well be a million miles away because I don't know how to be that. I personally reading this sort of fell in love with Magda and Richard in a way that I don't know if I was supposed to, but I just thought they were so fun. Do you have a fa favorite character or side character slash is there a character that you secretly think readers are going to love? Um, there's a character named Gogo in there who <laughs> appears briefly. She's always trying to befriend the plants. Um, she may be my favorite. Uh, I'd like, a, you know, there's something about British rich people that we seem to like. You know, I do. I can't help it. I know they're not. Look, I, it's like it's like one of us has a very successful podcast about royalty. You know what I mean, though. Like, why do we it's care about that? Yeah, like we just we were like, I I don't, I know I shouldn't want to know, and yet I just super duper want to know. And British, I live. My husband's English, and it just seems like there's more stuff in their family. Like he's got two sirs in his family. That's a true story. That makes me laugh so hard. I could almost like the first time I realized that I almost fell off my chair, but he does. He has two sirs in his family. Um, but it just seems so fancy. I'm like, why are you so fancy? He's like, it's not fancy. I'm like, it is fancy. Like it is demonstrably fancy. Um, just, it seems so everything's kind of tied in together. Like, Oh, someone has done something with ships, or someone saw the queen at the the supermarket, and someone like it's just very casually fancy. There's um, something also about like being rich and like knowing like where to go and what to do, mm -hmm. and like even if they have bad taste, because a lot of rich people have bad taste, mm -hmm. they still like oh, this is where you buy. Oh, you want to buy a Faberge egg? Here's where you do it. Like they know. Oh, this is how you wear you summer. This is how where you buy mm -hmm. wallpaper. They like there's a, a competency of consumerism that comes with being rich that I think people gravitate towards, well, myself they, included. They use summer as a verb, and you know, yeah. that's where it begins. <laughs> yeah. But, but is, it's this idea that there are houses in your family, that there are that there's an ease to it all. Like one simply does just one simply has and and your your house full of junk is house full of silver and antiques and you know it's just very magda and richard have just always had everything and yeah. so they have collected estella they just collect her that's exactly it. it's almost like it's like incredibly it's not cruel but it's like condescending the way they befriend her of like that she's just an object of fascination sort of yeah, they pick her up like, oh, we went to the store and we found this. Oh, cool, a pickpocketing orphan. Let's take it. We haven't it. one of those before, yeah. It, def it definitely feels like, uh, you know, certainly you have covered Marie Antoinette in detail and she has like a little fantasy village, a little, what was it yeah. called? The, um, petit, um, the little- uh, Petit Trianon, yeah. It was, she liked to play villager. The little milkmaids that she would hire that there were people she had like a little cottages built and people that just were there to bake bread all day or milk cows the sweetest little thing is she liked um 
she wanted to like pluck eggs from underneath hens, but like she didn't want to touch like gross eggs, like which are, I don't know, covered in like whatever they come out of with egg, with chickens. So like someone would take the eggs, wipe them down and put them back for her. It's so sweet. It's like, it's almost sweet. Yeah, that's so, so prime. That's some prime rich person stuff. Yeah. So obviously Cruella is a classic Disney villain in the pantheon of, of great Disney villains. Is there another villain that you would want to write a prequel for? Because I can think of like three off the top of my head. I don't think a Disney villain. Because uh, I, when I started this, I realized also my knowledge of Disney princesses is very poor. Um, like I know almost no Disney princesses. Can you believe this? I was a I was a Disney princess kid. I was a Disney kid. Like I want Ursula's story. Give me that. Where is Ursula's? I, that's the only one that I'm like Ursula for sure. I am a Disney World lover. Like I am yeah. obsessed with Disney World in a big and profound way. And in fact, I will say, and I don't know if Disney is listening. All I really wanted was like, if I do this book. Will you give me a fast pass for one of the rides? I was legitimately going to ask for it. I'm like, look, all I want Good is day. like, I didn't ask for it. I was too embarrassed. But if you guys want to give me a fast pass to the Haunted Mansion, that would really be appreciated. Because when this is all over, I will like to go to there. Um, I just, okay. Also me, if doing this event gives me any points, oh, great Disney overlords. Yeah, we would like a, I will tell you this. This is not relevant to this, but I was once at Disney World because I was help running a convention uh, at the Orlando Convention Center, and someone's like, I'll try to get you a fast pass. So we went over, because it was close, we're like, let's go over to Disney World for like half a day. And we went over and something happened in the line, like our thing didn't work right. And we were asking one of the employees, like, are like, we got a fast pass and it didn't work right. And the guy was so nice and he opened up his wallet. And as well as just like normal human wallet full of junk and stuff. And he pulls out this kind of dog-eared card that's clearly not like anything you give to people like he's like this is my personal fast pass card it's like it's something only employees get he's like i'm sorry this happened you know because we were we weren't even complaining we're like we just don't know how it works and he's like you can have my card and you can go to the front of any line <gasps> oh my god i would give a kidney for one of those i so my sister this is now so embarrassing now i'm revealing like what a disney adult i am uh, my sisters and I have been planning a Disney World trip as like a sister trip forever. And then the pandemic happened. So we're now gearing up for it. And like, I'm more excited than a 28 year old person should be. Um, I'm also, we have also been planning a Disney World trip and I am, um, I'm embarrassingly, I'm a big fan of the left-hand side of the park, of Adventureland. Of, yeah. Like, everything's sort of this side. In Florida, like, yeah. Just, give me I, haunted mansion. Give me Adventureland. Exactly. I love yeah. all of that. I could spend the whole day just there looking at those little tiki birds. I love them. You know, I do. Space Mountain might be my favorite ride, though. Oh. Okay. Right side this, of the park, straight to the right. No, that's on the left in Florida. That's on the left. Oh, that's, I'm, that's the, I've lived in California too long. That's the problem. I, uh, I'm thinking Disneyland. We used. The Fast Pass. Me and my friend Robin Wasserman, we took that Fast Pass to Space Mountain. She's like, it's no problem. Like, kids go on it. It's great. I'm like, I don't really like roller coasters, Robin. She's like, no, it's so fun. It's like nothing. Like, it is so fun. Okay, Dana, here's the thing. We get on this thing. Like, we start to get on. I'm like, what is this? So Space Mountain is a giant roller coaster inside of a darkened building that – yeah. You have no idea what's happening to you. You're just like, tick, 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 and you go into the darkness and things are like flashing and it shakes too. It's like, ah! it's, and I hear us ticking up, ticking up and ticking up and ticking up completely in the dark. And I'm like, this is going to be, I can already tell this is going to be the worst experience of my life. And so I was like, what can I do to get through this? And so I'm like, we have to start singing show tunes right now. And so I start singing show tunes at the top to try to keep myself from losing my mind. What Space Mountain is, is a an anxiety attack made flesh. Like it's just, it's in the dark. You've made no, metal. 
Yeah, it's just a metal anxiety attack that it traps you inside of. It shakes, it flashes. You've no idea where it's ending or where it's turning or what it's doing, but it is the worst thing that has ever happened to me. And I staggered out and grabbed a rack of keychains when I left and said that was the worst thing I've ever been through. Poor Maureen. Yeah. Well, on that note, uh, I feel like we should maybe open up to to audience questions because I've I've used up my my allotted thirty five minutes. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. So this question uh, is for both of you. I'm glad, actually. Let's, let's digress. I'm glad you talked about Disney because I love Disney so much. Let's you know, all go when again. this is over. Let's all go. Yeah. Let's do it. Field trip. <laughs> Get some but, ears. I feel like at this point, it, since you worked, we both now work in the, I'm, we're writing on a Disney Plus show. It's a tax write-off. It's, it's work. It's, it's research. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, the first question is, and this could be for both of you, and I'll have Maureen go first. Uh, my family's 2021 reading challenge includes a favorite author's favorite author. What are your favorite authors? I genuinely don't have one. I think when you like, how can you like? If you love books, then how, how do you how do you have one? You, you're laughing. I, I think Dana has yeah. one. Yeah, okay. I have favorite authors. I mean, authors certainly not author. Okay, who's yours? I think I I would say my favorite like childhood author is Ray Bradbury. He's like the one that like I think forms my childhood the most. And then my favorite probably adult author is. Kazu Ishiguro, who was the last year's Nobel laureate and just has written, I think, Remains of the Day. It's like my favorite novel. So, I, yeah, Ray Bradbury and Kazu Ishiguro. Certainly as a kid, I think, and a book I think about on the regular uh, is The Westing Game by Ellen Raskin. So that is definitely one of my favorites. Um, and it's just like such a part of me that I'm like, oh, it's just the Westing game. Did I think it up? I don't know. Like I, it, it's so in, I'm so, you know what I mean? It's so a part of you that you think you must have created it because how could somebody else have created something that's so deeply in your mind? Um, yeah. I was obsessed with the great Gatsby mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, uh, but I have too many favorite authors. There's too many good books. And when you, especially when you are a writer and like, you're just constantly getting more good books thrown at your head. Like, read this. And you're like, ah, thank you. And and this is, it's sort of cheating because the last book I read was Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro. And I do feel like usually my favorite author is the last, is the last good book I read. <laughs> yeah. All right. And <laughs> what are your favorite show tunes? Well, on Space Mountain, I started singing Hair. <laughs> and I began at the beginning. Like I'm a Lay Miz girl. Get me going on one day more. I'm really in the feels. And Sweeney Todd. I like Sweeney Todd. In college, this is a true story. I was in a modern day Occupy Wall Street themed production of Sweeney Todd, which is the most college sentence physically possible. I love it. I love it. Thank God there's no photographic evidence. <laughs> I worked in theater for a while. I and I, one of the most treacherous things I ever worked on was a musical adaptation of Kurt Vonnegut's Cat's Cradle, which is a whole story. But it was, uh, it was something. It was something. Oh my goodness. Okay. And this this can be for both of you. Uh, what fashions and designers inspire you the most? I dressed like a filthy, filthy person. Um, I have spent the last year wearing a lot of bag kind of things, um, yeah. just yoga something, like yoga adjacent, maybe their pants, who even knows? It's kind loungewear. Of, it's it's loungewear. loungewear. I have to put on my shoe substitutes for when I walk the dog. I like <laughs> to think of it as... Um, uh pandemic we can't call it chic let's just call it pandemic um that's me 
I also, I'm like, I think it's very sweet and generous that anyone would think I know any designer or fashion. I wear like Gap and Everlane and Zara. Like I, I am not, I love, I like clothes, but I'm, I'm not cool or yeah. rich. Yeah. Uh, I have, I guess the only ones I really have that are like, I have some Vivian Westwood things, which that sounds I like. Awesome. It sounds fancy, right? Um, that sounds very fancy. I bought my, my pandemic purchase. Uh, I got a, a new, you know, when I get a check, I got a Celine sunglasses. Feels very fancy. That's fancy. I'm telling you, but. resale, resale. That's how you do it. That's how you get the stuff. Resale. Yeah, how do I get this these Vivian Westwood dresses? That sounds fun. You go on do I need to get married? No, you go on resale sites. Yeah. Oh. You can get them for cheap. Oh, it's also better for the planet to buy resale. <laughs> yep. Okay. Saving money and going to Disneyland with Dana and Maureen. <laughs> okay, uh, for Maureen. Uh, which character that you've written has the most of yourself in them or uh, you relate to the most closely? There would probably be two. One is uh, Rory from the Shades of London series and Stevie Bell from um, Tr the Truly... Well, she's now just got her own. I'm just calling them the Stevie Bell Mysteries because Truly Devious is one series, but The Box in the Woods is a standalone. So I'm just now... I had to call, figure out what to call them. And I'm calling them the Stevie Bell Mysteries because she wants to solve a crime. She likes podcasts. My life is just the gaps between the podcasts that I listen to. So um, I have a real problem. Uh, those two for me. All right. And also, Maureen, what is your favorite Noble Blood episode? Oh, that's putting you on the spot. <laughs> um. You know, there's so many good, good, horrible things that happen. <laughs> I do like the Marie Antoinette stuff. Me too. If that's not I mean, obvious, I have a minor obsession. You know, I think, and it's, it just feels gross to kind of just go there, but just the weirdness of, you know, they're kidding, you know, they're, they're in prison, they're not in prison, they're, they're kept in a, then they're moved here and then someone tries to break them out. And like, and then they're, people are walking around with their Fred's heads on sticks and it's a, yeah. And just the fact yeah. that you could just kind of go into the palace. Yeah. Like surprising access. Wild. How many people were just at Versailles just hanging out? I think that's probably, you know, why we're all, we all still talk about it so much and also how wrongly she was treated and kind of, so yeah, I know it's yeah, an obvious could, pick, but. No, it's, I, I think that would also be my favorite pick. I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, okay, I agree that she should not have been hoarding that wealth, but also she didn't know any better literally. And maybe we shouldn't abuse people no matter what. <laughs> So my hot take. Yeah, it's fascinating. And yeah, great. All right, this question. Oh, it's from Kirsten. So Kirsten actually used to work at the bookshop. Hi, Kirsten. Is there anything you're not connected to, Kirsten? <laughs> I know. Disney, the bookshop. Um, she asks, she says, I loved your high scenes, especially uh, Herod's and Liberty of London. What was your research like for Estella's theory techniques? And do you have personal experience but only answer this if your mom is not watching i have never stolen anything <laughs> i i truly am too i it just i would i would be still on the ground with guilt if i'd ever shoplifted anything um i read a lot about i like to read about thieves though i like I have two things I love in stories. Like we all have a couple of things that we really like and there's lots of things I like, but I'm a sucker for in zombie movies where the, the scene where they go to the grocery store and they only have 10 minutes to get as many provisions as they can before the stores is taken yeah. over. And I like a lair. I love a lair. I'm into any, but so I like that they had a lair. Um, and so thieves often live in lairs. 
Uh, so reading a lot of books about pickpockets and thieves always is good. But in particular, I read a book called um, Going Shopping, which is about a woman named Shirley Pitts, who was the queen of the hoisters of East London. And there were these gangs of women who, I think there was one called like the 77, I forget what it is, but it was like a long standing gang of thieves. But Shirley Pitts was around the 50s and 60s and she was the queen of the East London hoisters and she could steal anything. She had a driver, she knew the craze, which were the, which were some gangsters. Mm -hmm. and, and she had these, which I can only describe as giant thieving underpants. So she would have these undergarments and she would go into a store beautifully dressed because she stole furs and designer clothes and jewels. And she would go in beautifully dressed and she could get anything out of that store down the bloomers. She would walk out with furs. She would walk out with dresses. She would walk out with jewelry. She would walk out with basically everything went in there. And then she would have a, her chauffeur car outside where she'd dump it all in. And they'd go on to the next place. And then by the end of the day, she would have this like, she had gangs of people. Oh yeah, it's amazing. Well, I want, I want to be that. And she used to call I mean, going no, shopping. I don't, sorry, what, no? Her, her runs were called, she would say, I'm going shopping. And that's, that was her thing. <laughs> so I gave her the big, the big, um, the big robbery underpants. Shirley Pitts's robbery underpants are directly in the book. <laughs> Um, here's a, excuse me, another question from Kirsten. Incense features heavily in Hello, mm -hmm. Cruel Heart. Can you disclose which scent of incense was so cloying that it caused Estella to have a kitchen sneezing fit and have to air out her dress? They used a lot of incense in the 60s. I mean, they burned a lot of things, but jo like the, the ubiquitous joss stick, it did seem like they were constantly, constantly burning just it was the it was when the whole incense burning started and so and they also you whenever you read stories of them they also seem to always be accidentally setting stuff on fire because of all the the incense and stuff that they burned so there's a lot of and then we then we accidentally set ourselves on fire oops but <laughs> i think you know what i'm talking about kristen and then our last it's not really a question um, it's a comment. Uh, doing more mm -hmm. books about the Disney villains and villainesses would be wonderful. Would you please consider writing their backstories? <laughs> Second, Ed. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. It's fun. I mean, it's definitely fun because villains get the best lines. Oh, they're so fun. Villains are way more fun than heroes. Yeah. We all like a yeah. villain. Yeah. <laughs> I was asked the other day in an interview to put together, uh, my editor asked me to put together an imaginary table of Disney characters that I wanted to have a meal with. And I couldn't, and I went blank and I was just like, the Mandalorian and the crab from the Little Mermaid. And that was it. So my dinner table is just the crab from the Little Mermaid and the Mandalorian like. Sebastian? And then just. This is the way. So he seems like a bad dinner guest. Yeah, that's what I liked about him is they just sits there and can't eat and does nothing. <laughs> I was like, I'm into that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, well, I'd like to thank everyone for watching. I'd like to thank you, Maureen and Dana, for uh, doing this with us tonight. This was so much fun. This was so much fun. If you're interested in purchasing uh, Maureen or Dana's books, click the button on your screen that says buy the books. Maureen was nice enough to send us signed book plates. So when you order your book, we'll uh, pop a book plate in for you and you'll get that. Uh, and obviously right. listen to Noble Blood um, oh, because definitely. I have, again, a real podcast problem. So I was like, oh, Dana's now doing it. But when you started your podcast, I was like, oh, great. You know, I'll just add that. Good. Good. I don't have it. It's fine. Let's just add it. Let's just add it to the pile. Come on, just bring it in. But yeah, you, if you want bloody, bloody stories of, of royals doing terrible, bloody things, and we all do, we all do. <laughs> that is the goal. And of course, everyone, pick up your copy of Hello, Cruel Heart. I was like, am I facing? It's that weird thing of you don't realize on camera that it's backward visually for you. Mm -hmm. My brain still has not adjusted and it's been, it's been months and a year, it feels like years of, of screen. Yeah, you guys all done. Are, are, I can't tell if people like 
virtual event. I but I do like virtual events in that there's no barrier to entry. Like it doesn't matter yeah. where you are, you can get to them, and I like that part. So yeah. Yeah, that well, part I want to keep. Live in the same city. Right. And lots of people here, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I want to go to author events, but I don't live, no no authors come to where I live because they just don't. But now it doesn't matter. That's doesn't right. Matter. Yeah, I think um, when we get back to in-person events, I really, I know for our stores, we'll definitely keep a component where there's a virtual event, you know, sort of a hybrid event system, even live streaming some in-person events. I think it's fun to take what we've learned and what works and, apply that so then they can be more accessible you know beetlejuice came to say goodbye and get his oh. dinner <laughs> well thank you again thank you so much for joining us thank you everyone for watching thank you for coming um, everybody yeah, thank you for funny. coming we'll see you again in the summer <laughs> yeah i'll be back at doyle's time later this summer let's That's do this right. Bye. all right have a good night thank you